to be randomly having guests come and join us um, based on Father Don's schedule. Um, as you know, he is in transition now to that tree, and there's enough going on for him right now that he just asked if we could have some relief for him. So this morning we have a special guest, Father Chris Manahan, Manahan um, from the Jesuit Retreat Center in Oshkosh. Um, some of you have raised up hands who have been to the Jesuit Retreat Center. I know there's a number of you. Father Chris has been there for five years, roughly, as director. Um, he's had an interesting life prior to becoming a Jesuit priest and director of a retreat house, so he'll go into that a little bit. Um, I had the opportunity to, to visit with him on his first year. I think my first retreat, um, a number of um, uh, men from our ministry went, and we had a, just an awesome experience. So he and his staff treat everybody very, very well. And just like to give him a warm welcome and hand it over to you. I'd like uh, to thank Kevin. Can you everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. okay. You know, I have a hundred percent hearing, but it's eighty percent on this side and twenty percent on this side. So I know what it's like to have somebody talking. What uh, I'd like to first do is thank you for having me here, uh, inviting me to the Fox Valley Bible Study, which I understand has four decades and more of history. So hopefully I can add another page to it today. Uh, the trajectory of my getting uh, to the retreat house and uh, being a Jesuit has a little interesting beginning because I entered late. I was 37 years old when I entered the Jesuit. Wow. I had been doing uh, newspaper reporting and editing uh, for 15 years after college. I had gone to the University of Minnesota, grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. But uh, after those 15 years, I had uh, kind of accomplished the goals I set for myself in college to head up a newsroom, have a nice place to live, to be able to travel. So once I got those goals, I said, do I want to keep doing this for 35 more years? <coughs> and what I didn't like is uh, it was all about my work. And what was sacrificed was family, friends, faith. So I enjoyed the work, but it had become too much of my life. So I was looking for something that would help balance my life out. And uh, my brother Tom, two years older, had entered the Jesuit about eight years earlier. And I like what I've seen happening in his life during that time. And so I started to think about that as well. And sure enough, I decided to say he had been in marketing for General Mills up in the Twin Cities when he entered. And I was coming from the journalism background. So we both were late vocations, but we're still we're still in the Jesuit. Uh, he's teaching at the Jesuit High School in Cincinnati, and I'm here at the retreat house in Oshkosh. So that's how I got here. Now, when Tom first started, uh, this is my first experience with Bible study. Uh, I wasn't I was in newspapers. I wasn't thinking about a vocation, but he was going into theology. And so my folks wanted to get him a gift of some kind that he was going to need when he was studying in theology. And he suggested a biblical commentary that they would use in class, the New Jerome biblical commentary. So we got that book. And so before we gave it to him, we sat down at the kitchen table and said, let's, why don't we open it up and see what he's going to be studying? So we opened up to a page and found a passage where it talked about the scripture scholarship on a particular verse that talks about Jesus' brothers and sisters, a reference in the Gospels to Jesus' brothers and sisters. So we read that, the three of us, my mom, dad, and myself, and we looked at each other because we had never heard anything about Jesus' brothers and sisters. 
And the scripture scholarship is, you know, talking about family relations at the time where cousins and stuff could be considered brothers and sisters. But it was such a shock to us that eventually after we were very quiet for a sec, you know, 30 seconds or so, that why don't we just close this book? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll let him study it. <laughs> but thanks for your studying the scriptures. It's a wonderful way to get so much more out of the gospel of the Old Testament by studying it, because there's a lot there. What I'd like to uh, use today is uh, a couple of things. One is on retreat. You know, the Jesuit retreat house has two types of retreats. September through May, it's a Thursday evening through Sunday afternoon preach retreat. So you come, the retreats are silent after that first night uh, conversation at dinner. So the silence helps. It gives you a lot of time and space to be with God in your prayer. During that time, there's a retreat director who gives talk throughout the retreat, half hour talk, and the hope that it can add something to your own prayer or your reflection. So that's one type of retreat. In June, July, and August, in the summer, we switch to a longer retreat of five days and eight days. Again, it's silent. But in this retreat, you don't have a retreat director giving talks throughout those days. Instead, you meet once a day for up to an hour with the director, the same person each day. And you go through the eight days or the five days having that conversation once a day, and then the rest of the time is yours. You know, we offer Eucharist, reconciliation, um, healing service, other things are going on, but otherwise it's just yourself and God in prayer and relaxing, resting. So many people, that's the important part of it, to have some time to rest. Well, we just started an eight day retreat two days ago, and this is what I offered the people I was directing. I was going to be seeing retreats through these eight days. It gave them three psalms. This was the first night, just getting started. And the psalms I gave them, 131, 46, then Psalm 42, 43. They combined those two. 131, 46, 42, 43. I want to read just a portion of each of those psalms, and I'll explain why I use those. This is from 4243. As the deer longs for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God. My being thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and see the face of God? That's 42, 43, the first two verses. Psalm 46, a portion of that psalm. God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in distress, Thus, we do not fear, though earth be shaken, and mountains quake to the depths of the sea. Though its waters rage and foam, and mountains totter at its surging, the Lord of hosts is with us. Our stronghold is the God of Jacob. That is for Psalm 46, the first verses. This is Psalm 131. Now 
I'll read the entire psalm. Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I do not busy myself with great matters, with things too sublime for me. Rather, I have stilled my soul, hushed it like a weaned child. Like a weaned child on his mother's lap, so is my soul within me. Israel, hope in the Lord, now and forever. That's Psalm 131. The reason I give those three psalms is that each has an approach to God that's different. You take a different stand. That 131, which we just heard, it's a song where I'm saying, let me just rest and be still. And certainly at the beginning of a retreat, that's what we always hope we can do. Just all the commotion and the turmoil that might be going on outside or inside of us. As we begin the retreat, we want to have some rest and to be still with God. So Psalm 131 talks about that in words that we can understand. Psalm 46, that stance and that psalm is recognizing how God is my stronghold, is a refuge for me. So oftentimes when we come into the retreat, that has been the case over the previous year. We've had occasions where God has been there. And we've relied upon God and needed God. And that psalm expresses that in words that maybe I cannot come come up with myself, but when I pray that psalm, I recognize it. God is my stronghold, my refuge. In that very first psalm, 42-43, it's a little different stance, coming into a retreat where things are not quite settled. And so we call out, my soul longs for you. And as you go through that psalm, it talks about the things that have been difficult for the, the one praying that psalm. And then we can see ourselves in it as well. This particular year where many things have happened that we've had no control over or wish wouldn't happen. And we express that in this psalm saying, God, where are you? I'm longing for you like a deer longs for water. I need you to sustain you. And so when I give those three psalms, I just ask the retreatant, as they begin this retreat, what parts of those psalms express what you're feeling as you begin this retreat? And that gives me a sense of what might be helpful as I listen to them. Um, are they longing for God in a difficult situation, wondering where are you? Or have they experienced God being there and being their stronghold, someone to rely upon? Or are they seeking just to be rest, restful and still? in the days ahead. And that's helpful to hear from someone beginning a retreat. Where are you? And the Psalms can help that. <coughs> the reason I find the Psalms so helpful now is they express things, emotions, feelings, thoughts that have been felt ever since they were written. You know, you think some of these psalms go back a thousand plus years. Some credited to David. And they were such a 
essential part of the Jewish faith from that 500 BC to the time of Christ that Jesus prayed the psalm. And we do the same. There are all prayers well. You know, half of the psalms, or almost half, are what are called lamentations. Where we're expressing in the prayer, in the psalm, the troubles. The troubles I'm having. And where I need God to help. Lamenting. What's interesting is the lamentations by the end usually will express, I have these troubles, these difficulties, and I tell them to God. And by the end of the psalm, I'm praying in a way that, but God, I trust. I trust in you. You have been there before, and I trust you will be there again for me. So even though it's a lamentation, by the end of the psalm, usually there's a sense of relying upon God and trusting in God. When I uh, was in my formation uh, as a Jesuit, which was usually 10 to 12 years, from the time you enter till the time you're ordained or finished with formation, part of that formation involved working in a Jesuit apostolate full time for two to three years. And so I was assigned to teach at Red Cloud Indian School on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, which we still have. Uh, school's going quite well. Well, I'd taken some teaching courses and did student teaching prior to this, but that's different. <laughs> Anyone's been a teacher? <laughs> so here I am in my first year of teaching. Red Cloud Indian School, whole different culture, different way of doing, uh, doing things. And there I'm learning how to teach. So I'm uh, nervous, <coughs> having difficulty, classroom management, uh, subject material. I was teaching civics and geography, which that was my background, and I enjoyed that, but still the first time. So by the end of the day, I was exhausted, either because of frustration or disappointment, uh, wishing I would do better, wishing the students might be better uh, for me. And so when you come to the end of the day to pray, I was finding I didn't know what to say. <laughs> uh, I had said enough during the day, all the words were gone, and guess what I could rely on. This is how the Psalms became significant, and they meant, started to mean something to me more so than before, because in the Psalms I could find the words that reflected how I was feeling, and half the time, at least, were lamentations. <laughs> <laughs> and then another moment in my life, about the same time, I, I was a student teaching teaching at Red Cloud from uh, 98 to 2000. But at the same time, uh, my, both my parents uh, passed away in 99. Well, when we looked through my dad's bedstand, we found uh, in the drawer different books. Uh, one was a psalm book. Not this one, but an older one, an older version. That would have been from the 50s, I think. And he had marked with a piece of paper in, in the psalm book and opened up to the page and then also a penciled check mark next to a particular psalm, which for me indicated this is the one he would pray most often. And it was psalm. 131. And when I knew my dad prayed, but it was ne not necessarily the rosary was the more common prayer that I knew he would say at lunchtime when he was working 
or during Lent as a family, there were nine of us. And so uh, during Lent, we on Fridays, we'd go into the living room to pray, and all the kids would have our heads buried in the cushions of the couch. <laughs> and my dad would be very serious. And of course, that made us laugh, <laughs> how serious he was. So I knew that prayer of my dad, but I never realized he would have been praying otherwise. And so when we looked at 131, it fit him. It fit him very well. Him. Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I do not busy myself with great matters, with things too sublime for me. Rather, I have stilled my soul, hushed it like a weaned child. Like a weaned child on its mother's lap, so is my soul within me. Israel, hope in the Lord, now and forever. And certainly, my dad and mom both, that hope in the Lord was a given. You know, with nine kids and then a cousin came to live with us when his parents died. So the ten of us were a bit of a chore. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> uh, and that hope in the Lord, though, is something they never talked about it, but they kind of lived it out so we would recognize it. Well, how? And then we would ask them later because the ten of us would go different directions as far as faith and going to church and all those things which many families are familiar with. And when one of us would be off, uh, I'd ask, or they would ask, you know, you know, why why this is happening? You know, why wouldn't you come to church and uh, practice your faith? Because this is what they would say. We don't know what we would have done without our faith. We don't know what we would have done without our faith. And their concern and their worry for the different ones of us and going different directions was that there will come a time when you are going to feel lost or discouraged or despairing are you going to have God close enough to be able to rely on that was their concern that there come a time where you need your faith and your answer has gotten lost along the way so that psalm that my dad had marked out and then my experience teaching and the Lamentations brought the Psalms alive to me. They weren't just prayers from thousands of years ago by people who I didn't know. Instead, the prayers from a thousand years ago, years ago from people I didn't know, but they're saying the same thing that I wish I could say. And, I, and they gave me the words. And at a time when I was too exhausted and my mind was too blank for myself. So the scriptures, the Psalms being a part of the scriptures, are important to me in that way and have been. But it developed over time. And there were particular instances why they became important. And uh, I guess I would guess all of us have to trace that in our own lives. When the particular passage, whether it's Old Testament, New Testament, or the Psalms, has taken on a new meaning and has been there for us. And that moves me to a time in Jesus' life. If you turn to Psalm 22, and we're very familiar with this psalm, the opening verse, because it shows up in the gospel. Jesus crying out on the cross. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from my call for help 
from my cries of anguish. My God, I call by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I have no reason. A great lament from the cross in Jesus' own words in his mouth, praying that Psalm 22. But as I mentioned, those psalms of lamentation progress from that lamenting to then a trusting. And if you go to the end of that psalm, verse uh, 28, let's start there. The same prayer, and if you can think of Jesus having this psalm in mind, the prayer now says, all the ends of the earth will worship and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations will bow low before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, the ruler over the nation. All who sleep in the earth will bow low before God. And all who have gone down into the dust will kneel in homage. And I will live for the Lord. My descendants will serve you. The generation to come will be told of the Lord that they may proclaim to a people yet unborn the deliverance you have brought. And when we think of the cross and the resurrection to follow, how clear that sense Jesus had of the deliverance that was coming about through his own death. And for every generation to come, that that would be told. So this Jesus' prayer on the cross coming from the psalm, lamenting the suffering, the death, but also recognizing what was to come, the hope and the resurrection that would come. And that's our whole life, our whole faith that same sense of hope and resurrection, new life, in the midst of suffering, death, our faith is one of hope and resurrection. When I entered the Jesuit, I'm going to check the time, so... <laughs> Check out the okay, father. Show him your phone. Pardon? Show him the phone. Oh. <laughs> yeah. The other one scared me. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I can tell. <laughs> oh, good. I might save this. Uh, not put it out for a rummy. <laughs> when I entered the Jesuit, along the way, the scriptures are used quite a bit, as you might guess. And the founder of the Jesuits, St. Ignatius of Loyola, relied on the scriptures a great deal in his transformation in his life. And he relied on a particular way of praying with the scriptures. And it's uh, not too different uh, from Lectio Divina, where you sit with, with the scripture and just meditate sit with it, and let it sink in, let God move, move you uh, through the scriptures. But he, he found also very helpful adding an element to that Lectio Divina, the meditation, that he considered contemplation with the scriptures. And in that way of praying, what Ignatius would ask is for God to guide him as he read the scriptures. Taking a passage, asking God to guide me, guide my imagination. Now granted, we have our intellect, our memory, understanding to rely upon. But the Jesus asked that God guide my imagination and place me where you want me to be in this particular scripture passage. Help me imagine myself in the passage. And the reason he 
he found that so helpful is if we approach, if he approached scripture with his intellect and thought, that was at a particular level, rational thinking level, which was fine, it was very helpful. But using the imagination and trusting that God would guide us, it would open up another aspect of the scripture that he might not have found otherwise. Because the imagination can help me imagine who it is that I see, where it is that I am, how is it that I'm feeling in the midst of this passage, what do I taste, what do I smell. It, it's a very sensual, using all of our senses, and asking God to place us there in a way that he wants to show us something about this passage that he wants us to learn, to experience. That contemplation, Ignatian contemplation, is something that I got introduced to as a way of praying in the Jesuits. And it has, it's eye-opening and it's helpful it's not that you do it all the time, but when it's when the time comes, it can be so uh, instructive and moving. For Ignatius, it moved him to the point where he felt close enough to Christ to be a companion, to treat Jesus as a companion, and to be of service to Jesus. And that's how he entered the thought of starting a religious order and serving the full the needs of the church. Because he was so moved by contemplating Christ's life in the scriptures that he wanted to be a companion to Jesus. And he founded the Society of Jesus with that in mind. That we would be close to Jesus not only in the sense of knowing about Jesus in our head, but feeling as if we know Jesus in our heart, in Jesus' heart. And the contemplation helped him do that, feel that. Because it involved all of his senses, and he trusted that God would guide him in the various scripture passages he would pray with. Let me be there. Show me what it is that I need to see in this passage. Well, I'll share uh, an example of how it worked uh, and would have helped me. I mentioned my parents died in 1999. Uh, my mother in February, my dad on New Year's Eve, 99. And as sometimes happens, my dad had been sick for longer, two or three years, so my mom was taking care of him. Uh, but she ended up dying first from a cancer that had come back. Well, the time leading up to their death, so many of us go through lots of ups and downs, and what do we do, how do we handle this or that, and uh, so it was miserable, miserable. And in one case, I was coming uh, home for two weeks, just as my dad was coming out of the hospital after a stroke. Uh, and so I thought, that's great, I'll be home for two weeks when he's home. He can help my mother do the therapy that my dad needs uh, as he gets home, and that'll be perfect. Well, when I started the therapy with my dad, he thought I was trying to kill him. Because <laughs> it was a lot of pain. A lot of pain. He had no cartilage in his knees, so here all these exercises are to move, or move around. Yeah. And uh, so he thought I was trying to kill him, and I, of course, wanted to kill him. This <laughs> <laughs> was miserable. So each night I go go to bed with that same kind of feeling. And my mom and dad too uh, felt the same way. And so I thought, well, how can, how can I figure this 
itself and imagined it otherwise. And uh, so I relied on contemplation and said, where would I put my father and mother in the scriptures? Where would I imagine them to be, all the three of them? And this is what came to me. My, dad, my mother, I saw as Jesus in the garden. His agony before facing his own death. His agony in the garden. So I said, that's, that's how I feel my mother, Jesus, would understand. And, uh, she'd be with him in the garden. He'd be with her. My father, because of the stroke, it has limited what he could do. And this is somebody who would do anything. He could do anything, not in my eyes. So I imagine my dad as Jesus' lifeless body being brought down from the cross. Because of the kind of disappointment and sadness that that must have been for the disciples, for Jesus, to think that this one who we thought was the Messiah no longer is here. No longer is able to do the healing, the teaching, the preaching, the lifeless body. And my dad's disappointment and sadness and all of ours that he no longer was able to do what he wanted to do and would have wanted to continue to do. So those were the two places I imagined my mother and father. And then myself, one of the disciples. Disappointed, sad, perplexed. What to do now? And Jesus is gone. Um, and for me, what to do now with my parents trying to make things work when things aren't working? Well, that that gave some consolation because you know that sense of you know Jesus would understand this. The situation we're in, because he's lived through this as well. Well, I went to the retreat after the two weeks at home. My dad was very glad to see me go. Wished <laughs> <laughs> <Just> me well. <laughs> I went to the retreat, and the Jesuit who was directing me on that retreat, uh, I explained to him what had been going on, and uh, he said, "Chris, you might be interested to know that in the scriptures." In Luke's Gospel, where the agony of the garden is spoken of, he uses that word, a Greek word, agonia. It only shows up in that spot. And that word in Greek is typically a sports term. A sports term that refers to the condition of an athlete before they face a difficult struggle competition. The condition that the athlete is in would be called an agonia. The athlete's in an agonia. And Jesus is described that way in Luke's gospel, an agonia. But he added something that was helpful. He said, it means the condition one is in before facing a horribly difficult but ultimately victorious struggle horribly difficult but ultimately victorious struggle. And so with my mother and mine and the agony that I saw her going through, I told her, I can see the horribly difficult part. But what's, where's the victory? Where's the ultimately victorious part? I couldn't see that. So thankfully, he explained to me, well, the suffering that your father is going through and your mother and yourself are going through the whole family, that suffering will end. That will come to an end, that pain and that suffering. But what will remain <coughs> is the love your mother has for your father. Father has for your mother, that they have for you, 
do that for that. So it's the love that is ultimately the choice. And that's what we need. You know, this, my mom and dad died in 99. And the longer it goes since, the, the more truth in that observation that the director made for me. Because really, that is what it has remained. The love is still felt. And I can feel it from that feeling. So that really is ultimately what Victoria is. Suffering in it. When, in, when we think of Jesus' own suffering and death, and how we live our lives now with that love of God, the care of Jesus, so much a part of our lives and what we rely on, the same dynamic is shown. His suffering ended. His disciples' suffering ended. Whether they were martyrs or uh, sent to faraway places. Or, but what has continued on and has remained ultimately victorious is God's love. The love that's expressed between us and from God to us and us to God. That is so helpful. And you never know when you learn something or someone teaches you something how it's going to be of a help later. But that whole idea of contemplation, imagining myself in the scriptures, but that's just one aspect that I learned something that I wouldn't have been able to think it through. But seeing my mother in the garden, seeing my father as Jesus coming down from the cross, and then having that retreat director help me understand that part of the scriptures, the agony of been a, a godsend, literally, a godsend. So I hope uh, in your Bible study work over these years, that's happened in your own prayer, in your own life, in your own study. There's something you've learned could be months, years later, is of help. It comes to play a part in your life that you wouldn't have thought about previously. So that's why in the scriptures I find uh, so helpful and Ignatius' way of approaching them. To meditate on them, but also to contemplate. And you trust that God will guide you so that I can go closer to Jesus by imagining myself with him, with whom he restored. And whatever the lessons are that he, God wants to give us, I'm open, I'll be open to it. But uh, the contemplation, just basic steps to it. Whatever, find the passage that you want to sit with. Have that ready. Find a place that you're comfortable. Preferably not horizontal, because that's too <laughs> easy. So, yeah. But a place where you're away and not inhibited in any way. A place that's prayerful. Then, so the passage, the place, and then recognize that you're putting yourself in God's presence. And that can be a particular place you set aside where you always know this is where I pray. Or certain gestures help, help us realize that God is with me as I do this. The posture, the kneeling. And then go back to the passage that you selected. Begin to read it slowly. Stopping where you feel like you need to stop. And after having read through it however many times, then asking God God, God, where do you want to place me in this passage? Where is it that you want me to be so that I can learn, grow closer to Jesus himself? And then 
let whatever happens, happen. Uh, one of the chief directors I had um, would always scold me when I'd come in and say, oh, not much happened today, or in my prayer, uh, nothing big. He says, Chris, you don't have to evaluate. Just tell me what happened. And often, if I didn't say good, bad, mediocre, put a label on it, and just said what happened, I realized there was more that happened than I realized. Than I realized. And that's, in, uh, sometimes that gets in the way. We're trying to judge it as we're praying. Just let it happen, and then afterwards, write down or go over our mind. What was God showing you? That Ignatian contemplation is another way that scripture comes alive for us. Uh, the studying of it as well. But uh, I just offer that since one experience I've had most recently has been most significant for me. The psalm in ancient contemplation is what I leave you with today and uh, open, open for questions if there are any comments. Thank you. Ignatius was a bit of a, 
a thorn in their side because they would create this commotion. Uh, so finally, they they had given the uh, edict of uh, either leave or go excommunicate you, <laughs> which they could do because they're the keepers of the holy site. Well, he didn't want to get excommunicated, so he went back to Rome, and then he started talking on the street corners, preaching to people on the street, and uh, wasn't necessarily accepted very well that way by church officials, and he also realized himself that he didn't know enough to be preaching like that. So he ended up going to school at Paris, University of Paris, and that's when it started to gel together. He met other students who he talked about uh, these spiritual exercises that he, from his experience, had written down, saying this is how I grew closer to Christ, using these exercises, and found my purpose in life. And he talked about this to fellow students. And so a group of seven of them came together and said, we're going to go to Rome and put ourselves at the service of the Pope. And that was uh, 1540. So he got injured and was bedridden in 1522. 1540 is when he got together with his companion, formed the Society of Jesus, and the church approved it. 18 years. So you know, it's always, for me, coming into the Jesuits at 37, you know, years, a little later than most of uh, But it, his life was an example of that, taking time to discern and have God guide you to what your purpose is. It took him 18 years, but all those years contributed to the success and the faithfulness that he showed. In forming this Society of Jesus. He died in 1556. So during those 15, 16 years, instead of being a missionary, which he had always imagined, and being, he was the one in Rome putting together the Constitution, the spiritual exercises, forming Jesuits. And those were the ones who were going out to India, Japan, parts of the New World. Um, died in 65, uh, natural causes, um, he had kidney problems all through his life, digestion problems, that eventually is <coughs> what he died from. But uh, what impresses me is he used his own experience uh, with the scriptures, with his prayer, and just wrote down what happened to him, enabling him to grow so feel so close to Jesus that he wanted to serve him in this way. By being able to write it down and put it in a method that others could use now, still, it is impressed, impressed me. Because I could go through it. I could imagine myself going through it, but I'd probably never write it down or be able to pass it on to somebody else. But he did. And uh, so like the retreat house, Jesuit retreat house here in Oshkosh, all of our retreats are based on Ignatius' spiritual exercises. And they can be conveyed and presented in so many different ways, but the core element is first feeling the love of God, recognizing it, examining my own life, where it is, what, what's going on in my life like he did during that year of being in bed. So, Knowing God's love, examining my own life, looking at Jesus' life, and what that teaches us, and the kind of love that that stirs in us to see Jesus going through what he did for us. And then finally, realizing the resurrection of Jesus and how that love of God <coughs> continues and remains through us to the point that we hope that affects the world the way Jesus is hoping that all the nations all the people would know the love of God through those who have experienced it ourselves and are willing to share it with us so those exercises um, uh, 
or what we use as the basis for our retreat. And um, so it still lives on. Uh, that's what impresses me about Ignatius. It took him 18 years to get there, but I guess all those years were necessary. Uh, and uh, so it gives us all hope that what we're doing today is necessary to get us to the point where God wants us to be when we finally meet him. Very saying there's still hope for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's still hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything else that uh, you have questions at all? So I will be here next week. So. And today's saint is Saint Aloysius, isn't that a Jesuit saint? Today's yeah, yes, Saint Aloysius Gonzaga. Saint Aloysius Gonzaga. Now there's somebody who had a quick trip. Too. He's 22 years old. He passed away while I was serving uh, in Rome during the plague, bringing people to the hospital when he caught the plague. The 23 years old uh, uh, died, but considered we were considered a saint. But yeah, he, he entered the Jesuit. He hadn't been ordained yet. Uh, the priest, so we're still in the formation process. We're studying philosophy, which is part of our formation. And he's in Rome and helping in the hospital. Yeah, good, good example.